So the purpose of meditation is uh, dependent on your goal. If uh, your goal is to follow a spiritual path, whatever tradition, and then the purpose of that is to uh, gain union with uh, mm, some uh, being or uh, with uh, the union of skill, skillful means and, and uh, wisdom in the Buddhist tradition uh, uh, to be able to relate to mind itself and the nature of mind, but meditation itself has been used by all the traditions. Um, the mindfulness tradition uh, of this modern day is based on what we call like uh, um, the Pali tradition. So the Pali tradition is mainly to do with the uh, Theravadan Buddhism, the Buddhism of Sri Lanka, or the Buddhism of Thailand, and a few other countries. Uh, one or two forms of the modern day mindfulness practices are based on uh, Mahayana practice, which is based on what we call the Sanskrit tradition. So, what do we mean by this? Well, each of those traditions has three parts to it. One is what the Buddha said. in inverted commas, because one was written down, the Pali tradition was written down 400 years after the Buddha died, and the uh, Sanskrit tradition, I believe, maybe 700 years. So, what the Buddha said. Okay? Then the Pali tradition has, has a text which deals with discipline. It's called the Vinaya. Um, so what the Buddha said is the sutras, then there's the discipline side of things, and then there's what we call <coughs> Abhidharma in the Pali tradition and Abhidharma in the Sanskrit tradition. The Abhidharma is made up of seven texts, and so is the Abhidharma. The Abhidharma has seven texts, and the Abhidharma has seven different texts. And uh, how they approach the practice is something different, which is something I'll speak about later. But the idea of the practice of mindfulness is very ancient, before the Buddha's time. It just so happens the, the, the Buddha approached things in a different way and developed a different system. Um, So that's from the spiritual tradition side. So the, the, uh, the modern day mindfulness tradition is 30 years old, something like this. And it was founded in America by John Kabat-Zinn in, in uh, the Medical Institute in Mas Mas Massachusetts, Massachusetts. And the purpose of that was uh, to help those that uh, the medical profession had given up hope on. That's how it came about. And it was dealing with issues like uh, um, chronic pain and things like this. And gradually has expanded into this kind of industry that's being promoted by universities to make loads of money and and uh, slowly they're saying you have to be more qualified and you have to do this course and you have to go to this place and you have to pay this much money and so on. So it's become a business. 
But in the same way, don't think that monasteries are exempt from this. They are a business too. They have uh, retreats to maintain, monks and nuns to maintain, uh, teachers to maintain, traditions to maintain, and so on and so on. So no matter how spiritual you get, you know, uh, there is a business side to it unless you go and live in a cave. You know, uh, but you already have a cave. You you have your home. You know, you have your simply heated cave with uh, all your facilities necessary. You know, to support your practice. So this mindfulness thing is about practice, okay? Um, you can, uh, I can talk all night about the theory, but in fact, uh, it's kind of, that would be a complete waste of time because you need to learn how to work with your mind. And so what we're going to do is uh, we're going to combine both traditions, and we're going to look into, uh, or, or actually not look into, but practice, learn to practice things which, uh, which are going to help you, not just when you're sitting on the cushion, but uh, when you're uh, going about your daily business. So, uh, this is how they train in the modern mindfulness uh, tradition, but this is also part of a tradition uh, in the lineage that I belong to, is learning how to use your daily life as the practice. So uh, whether your uh, goal is like long-term, kind of I want to become enlightened stuff, or whether it's I just want to feel more comfortable right now, which is what the modern uh, 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 tradition has more to do with, it's up to you. You know, you have a choice. You can make your way along this spiritual path and become enlightened. Or you can just uh, work at being a little more happy in the mess that you're in, you know. Uh, there was a story uh, This, this uh, great Tibetan master who, who, who uh, his name was Dilgo Chensi Rinpoche. He was, he practiced and taught every day for the public and anyone who would come and see him from six o'clock in the morning till late at night. And uh, uh, he spent so much time on his meditation uh, stool that that uh, even the mice were making uh, what you call nests inside his chair, you know, and living there. Mm. Anyway, one day there's well, there's a whole group of people sitting in front of him, and uh, this this guy said to him, uh, "So, what is the point of all this?" Hmm? And he leaned forward to his translator and whispered in his ear to make the best of a bad job. Okay? So we know what that means because we get up every day and we kind of uh, have to live through the experience of our lives, living our lives. And so we know about this. So that kind of makes sense to me. So what we're going to do first of all is, uh, this is an, an exercise that you can do uh, sitting. If you're sitting at your desk, if you're sitting in a chair, if you're sitting in the back of a car, if you're sitting on a bus, you know. Uh, 
it, it won't look too odd, you know. Hmm? So what I want you to do is, if you're sitting in the chair, put your feet flat on the ground and your palms on your thighs to begin with. And this is called five-step body uh, stress buster. So I want you to sit and close your eyes and just sit. Then I want you to bring your attention to your breath and your breathing. Just following the breath in and following the breath out. Then I want you to take a long, slow, deep breath in, and as you do so, start to screw up your face and tighten all the muscles in your face. So, taking a long, slow, deep breath in. And then as you breathe out, relax and release the muscles. And then go back to following the breath in and out. Just for one or two breaths. And this time as you slowly breathe in, lift up your shoulders towards your neck and tighten everything up. And then relax and release and breathe out. Then this time put your hands out in front, palms facing downwards. And this time as you breathe in, start to tighten your fingers and tighten your hands and going all the way up your arm, up to your elbow, then up to the top and then tightening all the muscles at the top. And then relax and release and breathe out. And once again, following the breath once or twice. Then this time, filling up your lungs and your belly. And then pushing out the muscles and hold your breath. Pushing them out. And then relax and release. Once again, following the breath. Now, this time as you breathe in, start to tighten up your toes and your feet and then your calves and your knees and your thighs and your buttocks, tightening as you breathe in, holding, and then relax and release with the out breath. Hopefully that should have released all the tension in your body. So you can do this sitting at your desk in your office. And now this next time, take your back away from the back of the chair. Push your bottom into the back of the chair. Holding your spine straight. And then this time opening up your spine from the bottom, following it all the way up to your shoulders, then up to your neck, just your spine, and reaching as far and as high as you can. And then allowing the muscles around your spine to relax and allow it to slowly drop down 
so as the vertebrae are falling one on top of the other. And then once they've come together and the muscles have relaxed, hold that posture, that position. This is posture training. Now this is another thing that you can do at your desk. You can do a hundred times a day. Now I want you to focus on your shoulders and feel them begin to relax. And go all the way down your arms, down to the elbows, down to the wrist into the hands and the fingers and allow those to relax. And feel the difference in your body and how this is affecting your mind. What's happening in your mind as a result of doing these things. Now focusing on your buttocks and relaxing the muscles in your buttocks and any tension in your thighs. You don't need to have any tension in any of your four limbs. And then go down from your knees to your ankles, down into your feet and into the toes. Feel what this feels like. Become aware of what's happening in your mind and the state of your mind. Has it changed? Are there more thoughts or less thoughts? Is your mind more clear and calm? And the next thing we're going to do is called the practice of inegri. Inegri is uh, the Mongolian word for smile. I want you to think in your mind, smile. And see what happens to your face and inside your mind. And now maintaining this feeling, I want you to move your attention and awareness down to your belly and your diaphragm. And just simply become aware of the sensations, the movement, how your belly and the base, how your lower back. Just lightly and gently focusing on the sensations there. And now relaxing the focus of your attention, just allowing your mind to be focusing on nothing in particular and to just relaxing like this for a moment or two. And now once again bringing your attention back the sensations 
at your belly and your lower back. And noticing what happens in your mind, what changes take place. Are there more thoughts or less thoughts? And if you find that your mind has wandered, then very gently bringing your mind back. Aware of the fact that this is what your mind does. There's nothing wrong or nothing incorrect. There's no need to criticize. No need to think you're not doing it properly. Now relaxing your focus, relaxing your attention and awareness, and bringing your attention back to your fingers and toes and very gently moving your fingers and moving your toes and opening your eyes and becoming aware of what's around you. So this is how you build up your endurance in your meditation practice. You may sit down to do your session for 20 minutes, half an hour, whatever it is. But within the session, you micromanage the session. You have to be aware of your mental state. You have to be aware of whether you're sleepy. You have to be aware of whether you're awake, aware and alert. You have to be aware of whether your mind's agitated and you have to take the appropriate steps within the session. And so you do small bursts of practice, then relax your mind. And rest in that relaxed state. And then begin to focus your attention again. In this way you build up uh, mental flexibility and, uh, as I said, endurance. And this idea of the practice of smiling is extremely important. All of the meditations that you do in the uh, uh, advanced Vajrayana practices of, of uh, uh, the Tantra. You imagine yourself smiling. Why? What happened when you smile? You're still smiling. <laughs> Even thinking of it changes your mental state. You understand? So, Medicine Buddha will be smiling, White Tara will be smiling, Chen Rezik will be smiling. So this is really important. It changes. If you sit down and do this before you're about to do anything in your office, it will change. It will begin to help you, kind of, even though you feel bad about the thing. You understand me? So what we're talking about is the practical use of meditation for you 
to relate to your daily life in a different way. So if we're trying to make the best of a bad job, then uh, we want to do whatever is going to encourage that best to occur. And this means developing an ability to remember to do this. Okay, this is called re-mindfulness. Okay? And you'll understand a little more soon because the, the, how mindfulness is defined, you know. In the, in the uh, uh, psychological tradition, is defined original, the original definition is based on uh, uh, the idea of the practice having, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, seven pillars or seven supports. And uh, um, these, these uh, um, supports are what we call uh, the mm, seven interdependent attitudes that one has to develop uh, as we are practicing. So this is a modern definition the definition of mindfulness according to the Abhidharma is slightly different. And uh, uh, at some point, uh, I'll let you know what that is. So uh, Kabat-Zinn uh, has defined these seven pillars as uh, developing uh, uh, non-judgment. In other words, uh, uh, not passing judgment on what arises in your mind. A thought is a thought. That's all it is. It's nothing else. But if you start to pass judgment on your thought, I don't like this thought, I like this thought, then a whole series of uh, actions is triggered, isn't it? Like, I don't like that ice cream, you know. Yeah, right. You know, it's like the meditator who's sitting meditating and they start, the, the idea starts coming to the, into their head like, I'd, I, I, God, I'd really like a cup of tea, you know. And if you begin to focus on this, you know, then, you know, the tea thing becomes a big thing and then, and then the idea of sitting with a cup of tea turns into the idea of making a cup of tea. It turns into the idea of leaving your meditation seat to make the cup of tea. Hmm? And then not returning to your meditation seat to drink it, but to go into your lounge <laughs> and sit in your armchair and turn on your favorite friends. Or he's friends. He likes friends. Hmm? And then... Uh, uh, the idea is uh, you have to develop patience, you know, towards yourself. In the West, we have a real serious problem with, with, with uh, uh, a lack of appreciation of ourselves. And this is because of how our society is developed. I mean, greed is good, you know. I, I was in in uh, Thailand recently, and I stayed in this house. Where this man and his wife had so much money they 
I mean, uh, it was kind of obvious that they weren't just rich. I mean, they were really rich, you know. And he had a Rolls Royce in the front of his house. And we stayed there for a few days, and I never saw it being driven. You know, of course I was a bit disappointed because I've never been in a Rolls Royce, and I thought, you know, <laughs> no way, you know. The other thing is, you know, we need to develop like a freshness, you know, in relation to what we're doing, our practice, you know. So you need to find different ways to do it. You know, you, you may, of course it's good to have some discipline like and say you're going to do a certain amount in the morning and a certain amount in the evening, you know. But the most important thing is to integrate it in and weave it into your life and to develop like an idea, like a, a, a this freshness that they call like this beginner's mind, you know. It's like a baby sitting in some really colourful place, like, uh, and just sitting, looking round, and fascinated by this whole thing, and, uh, how do you say, the freshness of this experience, you know, it's like the first bite of the, what do you like to eat? I mean, yeah, what do you like to eat? You like pizza, you see? So, What's the first, what's the best bite? Um, sort of best, maybe like a bit of like of the crust and then a bit of the middle part. <laughs> mm -hmm. See what I mean? <laughs> yeah. You see, so you already know. So you go there first, is it? Do you go there first? Do I go there first? Yeah. Yeah. See, do you understand? So the first bite, the bite that you like best. But the second bite doesn't taste the same as the first one, do you see? So what we want to do is we want to keep this whole experience fresh. You know, and trust is something else we need to kind of build up, a trust in our ability and in ourselves, you know? Mm. Trusting our feeling, huh? opening up to this, you know? Mm. And then uh, trying not to, to be goal orientated, you know, like, uh, you know, I want to get to the fourth level of samadhi. I heard about this, you know, so I, I want to get there at least, you know. Uh, the, 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 the goal is to sit down and to be able to persevere for the amount of time that you've made the decision you're going to do that for. You know, so in the uh, 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 a Buddhist tradition, uh, it's like every time you sit down, uh, there's no aim in mind. You're not trying to kind of achieve anything apart from kind of uh, bring about some stability in your mind. You know, that's it. But the stability could be experienced as your mind moving or as your mind quiet, depending on the level of understanding you have. Do you see what I'm saying? So it's dependent on your level of understanding. But the idea is there's nothing to aim for. What? Just sit down. Just uh, engage in the methods that you've been shown. and accepting what comes into your mind. Just accept it. Like a thought is a thought. You know? It's not a fact. It's a thought. And the idea of non-attachment, what does that mean? <laughs> Well, actually, the process involves 
becoming unattached, first of all. Yeah. So rather than uh, attachment, I call it involvement. So the idea is to develop less and less involvement with your thoughts and feelings and emotions. Yeah? Does that make sense? Uh, yeah. So the, these are the things that you're trying to kind of uh, um, develop. And through all of those, you'll strengthen your ability to rest in this, they say, they call it a mindful state. You know, this is not America, you know. And the other things which will help you kind of maintain your practice is uh, what we call commitment. Making a commitment to work with your mind. Being disciplined enough to uh, want to do this thing, to have an intention to continue this thing. Remembering, you know, reminding yourself to do these things. So I want you to sit, just for a second. Just sit, the way that you're sitting right now. Just sit, close your eyes. And now we're going to do the practice of one breath, okay? Now, how is your mind right now and how is your body right now? Now, I want you to take a long, slow, deep breath in and pay attention to this breath. And then holding just for a second. And then a long, slow, deep breath out. Slowly and gently releasing the breath. Then once more focusing on your fingers and toes and your arms and legs and opening your eyes, moving your body a little if you feel like it. What happened? And? And? Do you see what I'm saying? What more can you ask for? You just become conscious of your posture, aware of your breath coming in and coming out. Anyone else experience something similar? Hmm? You know, well, do you understand what I'm saying? This is really important. Uh, a simple thing like that, it changes your mental state and your physical state, okay? And your physical state affects your mental state. So if you want a clear mind, straighten up. If your mind is agitated, shrink your body down. It's very simple. So what I want you to do is, uh, I don't know if you're coming back, but uh, if you do, um, uh, I'd like you to take all of those things away and you start to practice those things and, and uh, how to say, interject them into your day. And here's how I'll help you remember, okay? Uh, first thing in the morning, you brush your teeth, isn't it? Then uh, I want you to brush them. I'll pay attention to brushing them, okay? 
at least two minutes. No. <laughs> Out the door. Okay, not, not that one. You know? Huh? Yeah, I think some of you recognize. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah? Two minutes. Okay? And paying attention to brushing your teeth. Not brushing your teeth and thinking about what you have to do today. Okay? Not that one. All right? Just very gently, very slowly. I'm brushing my teeth. You can even repeat this. I am brushing my teeth. I'm not doing any school, I'm brushing my teeth. And last thing before you go to bed, if you brush your teeth before you go to bed, see, I'm brushing my teeth. You know? I'm not preparing to go for sleep. I'm brushing my teeth. I'm here, right now, with my toothbrush, with my teeth, and with my toothpaste. Hmm? Very, very simple. And begin to think like this. You know. Think about the first bite of every meal that you have. Sit and have a look at your food and say, okay, what am I going to munch first? And take your time. Put the food back down, or your knife and fork back down, and then sit and chew it. And uh, you might find that the very food you thought you liked didn't quite taste the same anymore. Or you might find that the food that you liked, you love even more. Hmm. Loving food is a problem, believe me. <laughs> it's an expansive thing, you know. It's expansive and expensive. Hmm. So is there anything anyone would like to ask? I haven't even got through a page of what I was going to talk about. So there's, there's like endless amounts of stuff, you know. Because for me, it's really important that you get the essence of it, you know. You don't need all the peripheral stuff. You just need like a few things that are going to help you uh, develop this uh, uh, mindful approach to living, you know, more care, more attention, more relaxed, you know, find ways of like working with the stress, because modern living is quite stressful, and so this is what you have to do. So does anyone have any questions? talked about seeking enlightenment as mm -hmm. one spiritual path. Is that not the journey of a lifetime? Not necessarily. For some people it might take a lifetime, for some people ten years. Do, do you see? It, it depends on how, how developed the person is and whether they make contact with, with uh, those that can help them develop the, these abilities, you know. How would you define enlightenment? Is that complete non-detachment? Or non-attachment, sorry. How would I define it? I'll let you know when I get there. Well, the, the whole point of it is it's indefinable. But um, there is a definable path to bring it about. Um, and so there's, uh, the Buddha talked about the Eightfold Path. 
uh, this noble path. There's a, the, the Bodhisattva path, the 10, 11, 12, or 13 levels of a Bodhisattva. There's, there's the 12 levels of uh, Mahamudra practice. So there, there are ways of defining the stages uh, and there's also ways of defining the, the experience of that result up to a point. And then this point from the Mahamudra tradition is called uh, non-meditation, which means that uh, hmm, there is neither meditation nor no, not meditating. The whole thing is just, uh, uh, how to say, experienced in this way. And prior to this, there's a stage called what they call one taste, which means there's no difference between uh, suffering and not suffering. Everything is the same. Pain is the same as not having pain. There's no kind of difference in your mental state in relation to it. So there's no liking or not liking it. It's just how it is. What's the other? There's two, two more. The path of seeing. That's when you first experience natural mind or enlightened mind itself. And then there's the path of meditation. So the, this stage the meditation stage is something which is beyond the practitioner's control. Uh, you've switched the meditation on and it won't switch off. It stays on. So it's like you put the light on and it won't go off. It won't go off until all, all of the coarsest uh, Imprinting. Was your mind imprints? That's why you have memory, you know. So all, all of the most negative of these things, the coarsest negative things gone. You just empty, it's like spewing up. But in a spiritual sense, which means that that uh, uh, well, which means that you don't necessarily sleep, you know. You're just in a constant state of meditation. <laughs> no sleep. <laughs> so is that a reasonable... I think that would be the <laughs> Yeah, so... That will do for this week and the next instalment next week. And we'll just keep the instalments coming. Because, I mean, up to now, for, for some time, I haven't been able, I haven't had the uh, uh, wellness to be able to do this. But uh, in the last few months, uh, Most of, uh, well, uh, most of the problems which were preventing me from teaching have uh, kind of dissolved. And so I'm going to teach as much as I can because uh, I don't know how long I'm going to last. So. And I think it's important that, that you're able to receive this and work with it. Perhaps improve the quality of your life and if you do that then you won't be able to uh, prevent yourselves helping other people because uh, once you begin to resolve your own issues then, then uh, how you work with others changes. And then 
when that happens, how they relate to you begins to change. Because you're not the same person as you were. So they can't relate to you in the same way. You see? So whether you like it or not, through doing this practice, you're going to help yourself and inadvertently help those around you. So give yourselves a pat on the back. Now we use the end of session with uh, what we call a dedication prayer. And uh, this is to do with uh, uh, making sure that whatever uh, benefit we've derived from, from being here together and from doing some practice together Uh, we don't develop pride in relation to it. So we can't become proud of something that we've given away. So once you've given it away, you can't develop any pride about how spiritual you are or what a great yogi you are or anything like that. You just have to go back to making tea. You know. And then uh, most people... Here, they, they like to recite my long life prayer in the hope that I live longer. Longer than what? I don't know, but whatever. Okay, so there's a prayer which says uh, in English through whatever virtue. Through whatever virtue. Mm -hmm. So I'll recite this in Tibetan. I want you, if you don't know, know how, anything about this, to recite it in English. And then we go on to, well, we'll do this first. <laughs> And then there's another prayer, the long life prayer. So you can recite this in English or Tibetan phonetics or not at all. It's up to you. Thank you.